Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to the IYNTC 10 Grape Escape Destinations to Wine For for 2021. Uh, we just been to Armenia and uh, now we've flown over quickly to Bulgaria to be with Vasil, who's going to um, uh, present uh, Bulgaria as a, a fantastic Grape Escape destination. Those of you who weren't with us in the last uh, webinar, um, just to let you know that on the right here, we have a chat facility where you can say hello and greetings from Oxfordshire, for example, from Judith Lewis, one of our keynote speakers at the conference. Uh, so do say hello, say where you're from. And of course, uh, most importantly, if you have any questions for Vasil on Bulgaria, any aspect of Bulgaria, then, um, then please ask. Uh, I think you'll probably have noticed some of you in the program that uh, it was Zina and Vasil uh, giving the talk. We've only got Vasil with us, and there's a very good reason for that. Why is why is that, Vasil? Good evening, everyone. Uh, well, my partner in Bulgaria Wine Tours and in life, Zina, gave birth to our baby last week, so she has her hands full at the moment. So I'll be the ones only the only ones the only one presenting today. Okay, so mm -hmm. c congratulations from all of us at the IYNTC. Is it a boy or a girl? It's a boy, Adrian. Uh, Adrian, very nice, yeah. very nice. Well, <laughs> children are fantastic, and, and so good luck with that. You, you <laughs> Thank can't you. be having children around the house. <laughs> yeah. Right, so glass of my favorite Bulgarian wine happens to be uh, the great variety of Melnik. So uh, we've raised a glass of... Uh, wine made from the Melnick grape variety for to celebrate your uh, newborn to the world. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so we're going to start with um, a poll question. Uh, get it right and you get a special prize which will be delivered to you at the end of the uh, presentation. So the question is, um, how many wineries are there in Bulgaria? So let's um, all vote now. 30 seconds. Is it 82, 182, 282, or 382? Tricky question, really, if you haven't actually been to um, Bulgaria, but um, could be any of those, couldn't it? 82 or 382. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> okay, shall we uh, stop the poll there and let's go straight. Answers in the presentation. So listen yes. up and you'll get the answer. <laughs> so here we go. Over to you, Vasil. Thank you. Hello, everyone, once again. Thank you for joining uh, this virtual tour of Bulgaria. As Anthony already said, it's going to be just me presenting. Um, but I just wanted to say who we are first. Um, and by we, I mean Zina and I. We are the uh, founders of Bulgaria Wine Tours, which is a tour operator that specializes in uh, wine tours in Bulgaria. We've been doing that for over five and a half years now. Missing what we're doing in the last year, but hopefully better times will come. So basically with this presentation, we wanted to give you a glimpse of uh, what Bulgaria can offer in terms of wine tourism. Um, and also some other um, kind of combinations with wine tourism. But to start off first, let's just look at the map of Bulgaria. This is a map that we've made of the wine regions of Bulgaria. Um, officially the wine regions in Bulgaria are five and there are those kind of the blue colors, the green colors, the orange, the, the pink, and the purple. But you see a bit more shades of the different colors here because this, is, this, is, this map represents what the wine industry, most of the wine industry would like to see as wine regions because some of the regions are pretty large and there's very different uh, conditions, climate conditions, and also terroirs within those large regions. So uh, most of the wine industry would like a smaller segregation of the wine regions. This is why we've made uh, the map this way. In terms of location of Bulgaria in Europe, it's located in the southeastern corner of Europe. Uh, to the south, we have Greece and Turkey. To the north, we have Romania. To the west, we have Serbia, northern Macedonia, and to the east, the, the Black Sea. 
And before we delve in into the, the wineries and in the, in, in, into wine tourism in Bulgaria, just maybe a few numbers for the industry. And this is where the answer to the question at the beginning lies. So these are data from 2018 harvest because this is the last official official statistics is 2018. It takes usually two years for the official statistics to come out. So with the wine production of 104 million liters, Bulgaria is the 22nd largest wine producer in the world. Not too bad for a small country. And there are 282 wine producers. Now, these are the officially registered wine producers. And I say that because there's a very large tradition of homemade wine in Bulgaria. If you drive through Bulgaria and through the villages especially, every house has a vineyard or a small uh, vine tree and almost every house makes something out of it, be it wine or the kind of grape brandy. Uh, in terms of export, almost all of it goes to the EU, 87%. Uh, so this is our biggest uh, export market. So if you live in the EU, some country in the EU, it's more likely to find Bulgarian wine than if you live outside of the EU. So with this, let's start our uh, tour around Bulgaria. We will start with the region that has the highest number of wineries in Bulgaria. And this is the Thracian Valley. The Thracian Valley is that region with the uh, yellow and, and, and orange uh, shades covering most of the south of Bulgaria. It's a quite a warm region and uh, there are mainly red varieties uh, that are grown, uh, grown here. For each region, I will uh, also highlight some of the local grapes uh, because I think this is the more interesting ones for you. Of course, Bulgaria has international varieties, but I will be highlighting the, the local grapes. In the Thracian Valley, the most important local grape varieties are two red ones. On the left, you have Mavrut, which is a very old local variety. Um, supposedly, its origin is from the Thracian Valley itself. It's mainly grown in the Thracian Valley. Nowadays, also in other regions, but mainly grown in the Thracian Valley. To the right, we have Rubin, which is an interesting variety because it's a hybrid variety. It's a cross between Sierra and Nebbiolo. So it's kind of the Bulgarian child of a French and Italian parents. And you hear later in the presentation some other varieties that are crosses. And why, why is that? Why are there so many crosses in Bulgaria? or hybrid varieties is because uh, after the end of the Second World War until the end of the 80s, Bulgaria was a communist uh, state and the wine industry was state run. So um, there was a lot of research and development put into um, viticulture because either to improve local varieties, to make them easier to work with or to make them higher yield or for different reasons. So these crosses that you hear also later in the presentation are a product of this age of Bulgarian uh, wine industry. Before we kind of talk about wineries, I just wanted to summarize, if I had to summarize uh, what Bulgaria, the Bulgarian wine industry is in one word, I would say diverse. Um, in Bulgaria, we have both small wineries, large wineries, family-owned wineries, corporation-owned wineries, foreign-owned wineries. Um, there's no legal restrictions on what can be planted in the sense only these varieties in this region, only that variety in this region, what can be blended. So there's a lot of experimentation going on. And even if you uh, drive, even if you drive, even if you visit two neighboring wineries, they might be completely different with their styles of wine and their architecture, ownership, and, and so forth. So I just want uh, you to keep that uh, in mind as we move uh, forward. So the Thracian Valley, uh, as I said, the, the region with the most number of wineries uh, uh, in Bulgaria. I'll just highlight uh, some. Uh, on this slide, I've presented some, maybe the, the two most developed wineries for wine tourism in the in Thracian Valley. On the right, we have Villa Justina, not so far from the main town in the Thracian Valley called Plovdiv. We'll talk about it uh, a little bit later. And Villa Justina also has now a hotel and a restaurant. So really you can spend a whole day in, in, in this winery, beautiful setting, um, the vineyard just outside of the village where the wine is located. On the right, we have Dragomir Winery Estate, which actually the building is the newest winery building in Bulgaria, just opened last year, 2020. As you can see, it's very modernistic. It's only about 15 minutes away from the main city in the area called Plovdiv. Uh, and it's really an easy, easy way uh, to visit the winery, especially if you're staying uh, in Plovdiv. 
The next two wineries I would like to highlight, uh, I do so mainly because they're organic. Uh, just to show there's some organic production happening in Bulgaria. It's not the majority of the wineries are organic, but uh, the number is increasing. On the right, we have Zagreus Winery, uh, and on the left, Neragoro, which is actually an Italian old winery. So this is also an example of a foreign uh, investment uh, in, in, in Bulgaria. Of course, I will not show you all the wineries. Uh, I'm just highlighting, highlighting a few. And within the Thracian Valley region, like I said it's a quite large region. I wanted to maybe zoom into this small corner here on the southeast. Uh, and this sub-region is called Sakar or South Sakar. It's at the, by the border with Greece and, and Turkey. And why do I want to zoom in on that region is because uh, that diversity I spoke about can really be found in this region. Uh, it's a small region, but with many wineries, it's a very suitable region for viticulture. So there's many wineries there. It's very easy to visit a bunch of wineries in one day, but also there's a great mix of small family owned uh, wineries and, and then bigger, bigger uh, wineries. And just a few pictures from that region. Here on the right, in the picture on the right, you see uh, a tasting at Chateau Copsa, which is one of those small family-owned wineries that I, I, I talked about. Usually the tasting it happens, uh, uh, is led by the winemaker, who is this lady here, uh, or, and or the owner. So it usually happens on a table outside of the winery, in some of the other wineries, in the family wineries in the region. It can be inside the winery, among the barrels. But basically it's a very... Uh, nice and cozy atmosphere. It's as if you're going into someone's home and, and sharing uh, wine and, and often a home cooked meal. So it's a really uh, interesting experience. On the left is the newest addition in that region uh, called Zara. And now the pink part of the building is the winery. It's a very small winery. And then uh, next to it is the hotel with a very nice restaurant that has local, local food and also a small spa center. So this uh, hotel and a winery, Zara, is a great base to venture out to some of the other wineries uh, in this region. And just to kind of show the contrast again, the picture on the right, uh, it's another small family winery called Villa Basarea. And actually the winemaker that you saw in the previous photo is actually the wife of the winemaker of this small winery. And here we can do taste from tanks, taste from barrels, doing very interesting tastings. Whereas on the right is one of the biggest wineries, not just in the region, but also in uh, Bulgaria called Katarzyna. And uh, it's really fascinating to go to a winery that has maybe 60,000 bottles production. And then in a, few, in, a, in, in a couple of hours after the tasting, uh, be at a winery that makes millions of bottles, but still good, good wine. Uh, the winemaker still welcomes the, 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 the visitors. So... It's quite interesting contrast in, 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 in that way. Um, as I said, I'm not going to talk about all the wineries that are open to wine tourism in, in each region. But in each region, I wanted to highlight also, apart from the wineries, what are some other things uh, you can do, like cultural sites that can be incorporated into a wine tour? So in, in, when it comes to the Thracian Valley wine region, as I said, the major... Uh, city in the region is called Plovdiv. The picture on the left is the Roman amphitheater of Plovdiv. Plovdiv is the second largest city in Bulgaria. It's only an hour and a half, located an hour and a half away from the capital of Sofia, but it's also the oldest continuously inhabited city in Europe. So walking around Plovdiv, you see a lot of ruins, mainly Roman, but there's also some prehistoric uh, artifacts, many in the museums now. Uh, and it has this really Cool, cool and chilled vibe, cobblestone streets and uh, Roman ruins and nice cafes. So it's really a great base for a tour in the Thracian Valley, also because it has many restaurants, uh, hotels, different types of accommodation. So usually uh, we would advise if you want to explore the Thracian Valley, Plovdiv is a very good base for that. On the right, this is also where we are located, obviously, so we are, we are biased. <laughs> On the right, this is uh, Bachku Monastery, which is the second largest monastery in Bulgaria, located only about 40 minutes from Plovdiv. And the good thing of this mon of uh, visiting the monastery is that you go a little bit into the mountains because Plovdiv is located in the valley, so it's flat. And in this way, by going to the monastery, you can see a bit of the, of the mountains. Other cultural sites include uh, medieval fortresses, like the one pictures on, pictured on the left, and uh, a lot of Thracian artifacts, like here on the right, this is a Thracian tomb. Now, the Thracians, I just want to say a few things about them because a, they're quite important to winemaking in Bulgaria. The Thracians were 
tribes that inhabited the areas of southeastern Europe uh, thousands of years ago. And why we, we always like to incorporate some Thracian sites in our wine tours is because the Thracians were the first people to start winemaking on the lands of nowadays Bulgaria thousands of years ago. So the history of wine in Bulgaria is, uh, starts with the Thracians. So we, will, we like to kind of highlight that history. And a lot of the wineries also do so by uh, naming their wines after some Thracian rulers or lab labels according to some Thracian drawing and so forth. So definitely all over Bulgaria, there's opportunities to combine a uh, wine, wine tour with a visit to a Thracian site. Again, I'm going to uh, say this only here, but it applies for all of Bulgaria. Bulgaria, after Iceland, is the country in Europe with the most mineral water uh, resources. So there's mineral water all over Bulgaria. So wine and spa is a very easy and, and popular combination. In fact, these two pictures that you see on the slide are hotels that are owned by wineries and that they have also uh, mineral water in their, in their spa centers. So wine and spa is definitely a very preferred combination of, for people who come to uh, Bulgaria. Now staying in the south, but moving slightly north from the big region with the most number of wineries, you go to the smallest region with the least number of wineries. And this is this pink region up here called the Rose Valley. Now, if you imagine this as a topographic map of Bulgaria, right where the white kind of corner on, the, on your left-hand side, all the way to the Black Sea, there's a mountain range called the Balkan Mountains. So the, um, um, the Rose Valley is nested right under uh, the Balkan Mountains. The main, the main grape, local grape, that I would like to highlight here is Red Mis called Red Misket. Red Misket produces dry white wines, despite its name. The name comes from the fact that, as you can see on the picture, the skins of the grapes are a little bit pinkish. So Red Miskel is considered one of the oldest uh, white variety in uh, uh, local white variety in Bulgaria. And just not to be confused with Muscat. It's not Muscat, it's Misket. It's a still aromatic variety like Muscat, but it's a completely different variety altogether. Further down in the presentation, uh, you see some other Miskets. And uh, this is kind of a... And most of them are crosses, were created in the, in the 50s, 60s and 70s. So it was kind of, a, I guess, a generic name to give to an aromatic variety. But it might get a bit confusing. But Red Misket is the um, old native uh, white variety. As I said, the fewest number of wineries are in the Rose Valley. But again, diversity is the word I would use. Here on, uh, you have Chateau Copse, which is a Chateau-looking winery. It also has a hotel and a restaurant. This on the right is a picture of their beautiful vineyards going towards the Balkan Mountains. Stokopsa produces many white and rosé. And just a few kilometers down from Stokopsa is Sopot Winery, which produces mainly reds. And as you can see, the architecture is completely different. It's more of a traditional uh, Bulgarian 19th century revival architecture. It also has a guest house and a, a, a guest house and a restaurant where you can do tastings. But you can see even in this small region that the Rose Valley is, um, the wineries are quite different, both in their appearance, but also in the wines they make, the style of wines they make. The nickname, the other nickname of the Valley of Roses is the Valley of Thracian Kings because of the multiple number of Thracian tombs that are located in that area. Here on the left, you have Starosel tomb, which is the largest tomb that also served as a temple discovered to date from the Thracian times. And only three kilometers away from this tomb is Starosel Winery. So it's very easy to combine a visit to a tomb with uh, a wine tasting. Here on the right is another tomb called the Cousin Luck Tomb. And this is actually a UNESCO heritage site. And it's mainly because of these very colorful paintings on the, on the ceiling of the tomb. Very beautiful, uh, really very beautiful tomb. And of course, why, why is this region called the Valley of Roses? Well, it's because that's where uh, Bulgaria grows the majority of its roses. Um, I don't know if you know, but Bulgaria is one of the largest producers of rose oil in the world, and the quality of the rose oil in Bulgaria is considered to be of very high quality. And usually the rose harvest start, uh, is uh, in May until mid-June or so. And when we have tours in that, re in that time, you always like to combine a visit to a rose distillery, as you can see here on the left, uh, with a visit to a winery. Because of the rose distillery, you can see the whole process of boiling the roses, how the, then the oil starts uh, flowing. And it's really interesting for most people because really it's a unique product 
not too many countries have uh, large rose oil production. Bulgaria is one of them. So it is something unique for Bulgaria. And also uh, the first weekend of June every year in that same town with the UNESCO heritage uh, tomb called Cousin Luck, there's a rosé festival. So the first weekend of June of every year is the kind of the culmination of this festival. Uh, so there you have like a mix of um, rituals of the fields with the roses, harvesting roses, some ethnographic uh, and folklore rituals, but also in the same town, uh, there's a rosé expo. So uh, wineries from all of Bulgaria present their rosés in, in that weekend. So we also like to combine this event with a, a tour in the, in, the, in the Rose Valley. So definitely outside of wine, there's a couple of other things that you can do, interesting things that you can do in the Rose Valley. Moving on, and but stay, still staying in the in the south, but this time going southwest towards the border with northern Macedonia and Greece, is the Struma River Valley uh, wine region. You see, very seen wine region because of uh, also because of its ma its grape varieties. I've mentioned a few here, and I will I would like to highlight a variety that uh, also Anthony mentioned at the beginning, Melnik. So the first picture to the left, Broadleaf Melnik vine is the local uh, variety in the region. It's not only native to this region, but it's endemic, which means that it only grows in this region and specifically in the area around the town of Melnik. And this is why the name uh, is incorporated in, in the name. Um, the other two varieties pictured here are actually hybrids that are based on the uh, broadleaf Melnik vine. The broadleaf Melnik vine is quite whimsical. It ripens late, it has uh, thin skin, so it's not very easy to um, look after. So because of that, a number of varieties, not just the two presented here, but a number of variety hybrids were created based on the broadleaf Melnik vine. Uh, and the two that I've uh, mentioned here, Melnik 55, also called early Melnik because it ripens earlier, and Sandanski Misket are the most utilized ones. And Sandanski Misket being a white variety, so it's a cross between the red broadleaf Melnik and the uh, white aromatic variety of uh, Tamianka. A couple, a few wineries I would like to uh, talk about in the Struma River Valley. Here on the left, the white building, this is Villa Melnik. And Villa Melnik last year was voted in the top 50 of world's best vineyards, which is a, a very, uh, quite a high recognition. The other reason why I would like to highlight Villa Melnik is because uh, of the way they age their wines in, in barrels. The area of Struma Valley was millions of years ago, bottom of a lake. So uh, the kind of the soil is, has a lot of sandstone and there's these sandstone hills. We'll see them later in the presentation that are quite a characteristic of this region. So it's quite, uh, the, the rock is quite meek. So what Villa Mary have done is if you can see there's a hill behind the winery, they've dug in tunnels in the hill and that's where they age their, their, their wines. And they didn't do that just out of, uh, uh, they wanted to do something extravagant. This was the way that people back in the day were aging their wines. They, 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 had, they usually lived a whole family of maybe three generations lived in a big house. And then a tunnel was dug behind the house into the hill. And that's where the wine was, uh, was stored and aged. So they kind of preserved that tradition in this modern winery. The other one into the right is, is an organic winery. It's called Orbilus. You can see the architecture is quite interesting, uh, a barrel-shaped uh, winery. Sometimes we joke uh, with the owner that this is probably the, the largest uh, barrel full with wine in the world. Maybe we should check that with the Guinness uh, World of Records, Book of Records. Um, and just uh, an example of some other wineries in the region. This is a great region for wine tourism because there's a cluster of wineries very close to each other and you can spend uh, a few days just touring around the wineries and they're very close to each other. Um, but again, as I said, different, as you can see the one here on the right, Orbeli is more of a um, traditional Bulgarian style architecture. And then on the left, we have a bit more of a, uh, let's say, uh, even a Chateau looking, looking winery. This is Rupel with a great view over the valley. And you can see not only their vineyards, but the vineyards of the neighboring wineries. Really beautiful view from this, from this tower here. Another reason why the Struma, Valley, Struma River Valley region is good for, is excellent for wine tourism is because of the different types of accommodation that you can find in this region. You can, you can stay in an old, in a renovated 
19th century, 18th century guest house, as pictured here on the, on the left. You can stay in a spa hotel. Uh, this is another area in Bulgaria that's rich in uh, mineral water. And this is actually at the spa hotel of a winery. The winery is located just up here. You can see on the picture called Villa Sindica. We can even indulge in some luxury. The picture down uh, in the right, this is from Zornica uh, Estate, which is a city, series of villas uh, and, and, and vineyards, and they have their own wine production. But they are part of the Relay and Chateau Association of independently owned luxury hotels. So they're very high quality accommodation and, and, and restaurants uh, in, in the estate, which makes this, this region really um, suitable for any type of wine traveler, be it one who is after uh, some luxury, be it also one who is after some more traditional uh, accommodation. When it comes to cultural sites, I'd like to highlight just a couple. Here on the left, we have Rio Monastery, a 10th century monastery. It's the largest monastery in Bulgaria. And it's also a UNESCO heritage site. And here to the right, uh, you see the town of Melnik <clears throat> that the uh, broadleaf Melnik variety is named after. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you can see these hills here behind the town, which are very, we call the sand pyramids, we call it in Bulgaria. So it's in those hills behind the houses that the tunnels are dug. Now, Melnik is an architectural reserve and it's really, I love being there because the houses are, uh, have 18th, 19th century architecture. They're all, all in the same style. Um, there's only two partially paved streets. The, the rest is this sand from the, from the roads. You almost feel like you're in a movie set or some like Western movie or something. It's really calm and peaceful. I really, really enjoy uh, staying in this, in this town. I think it's just an, an experience that um, it's not so easy to get in many places in, in, in Europe at least. And now moving north, uh, we go to the Nubian Plain, which is this blue, uh, blue section in the north, covering almost the entire north of Bulgaria. So it's a pretty large uh, uh, wine region. Two of the varieties I would like to highlight, uh, one is called Vrchanski Misket, which is another variety called Misket, but different than the red Misket. It's also native to the northwest of the region because there's a town called Vratza and Vrachansky comes from the town of the name of that town. Again, the northwest, another native uh, local variety that's uh, used is called Gumza. You might have heard of it as Kadarka in other, in other countries. This is the same, same uh, variety, basically. Uh, as I said, the, the Nubian Plain is a large uh, wine region. Uh, I'm just gonna, again, just show two wineries, not to take um, too much of the time. Just again, to show the contrast. Here on the right, on the left, you have Chateau Bourgozone, quite modern winery on the banks of the New River, you see in the background. And then on the left, you have a winery from the 30s, actually, but now, uh, of course, with a new owner now, called Borovica Winery, very small, uh, Wine, but very, very interesting wines. So again, the diversity I was, I, I was talking about. When it comes to cultural sites, the main site in the region or in terms of city site is Veliko Tornovo, which is the medieval capital of Bulgaria. Both pictures are from the city. It's a quite beautiful city located in, on some hills along the, the river that you see here. And on the right, this is the fortress in the medieval castle of uh, the Bulgarian kingdom that can be visited. It's an interesting um, experiencing great view over the over the city. Um, something else, one of the regions, this is something that I, I quite enjoy doing uh, with people. Uh, the, the Nubian Plain, especially in the northwest part of it, is one of the regions where natural sites can, visiting natural sites can be combined quite nicely with, uh, with a wine tour. So on the left here, you have a picture of some rocks. This, in fact, is a 35 kilometer uh, wide plateau of different rock formations called the Belgrachic rocks that are very, very interesting. And the small winery I showed you uh, a couple of slides ago, Borovica, is located in the foot of some of those rocks. So what we do with Borovica when we go visit them is we do the so-called wine safari. We take an off-road vehicle or 4x4 and we go up. There's some, there's some roads. We go up uh, the rocks and we sit at those kind of overlooks uh, over the rocks with a glass of wine and some uh, local appetizers. And it's really a great atmosphere and a great way to experience both wine and natural beauty. On the right, this is actually a cave, not so far from those rocks. It's actually a cave called Magurata. And the interesting thing about the cave itself is that there's some uh, 
uh, prehistoric drawings in the cave. But on the other side, from the tourist entrance of the cave, there's actually the first one in Bulgaria to specialize in sparkling wine production. It was uh, created in the 70s. It was a state-run winery. Now it's private, but they've kept the production of sparkling wine and they do it in the cave. So the wine ages in the natural environment of the cave. It's been bottled, disgorged, and all the procedures in the natural environment of the cave. And when we visit that winery, we actually do a tasting in the cave. So I think this is something pretty unique and maybe not too many, uh, there's not too many places out there where you can do a wine tasting in a cave, especially in a cave with some prehistoric uh, drawings on the walls. And to finish off with the cultural sites uh, in this region, uh, this is an example of two UNESCO heritage sites in, in the region. There's a, a third one also located not so far. On the left is the Thracian tomb of Sveshtari, which is my favorite Thracian tomb, very beautiful and exquisite, as you can see with these columns. On the right is the Mother Rider, which is a, a um, relief carved in, the, in a vertical rock dating from the 8th century AD. So, but you can still see kind of the rider, the, the, uh, the horse, and, and all those details. And to finish off with the last region, we go to the Black Sea coast, which is this region here in green. We've separated into nor northern and southern Black Sea coast. The, most of the wineries in the Black Sea coast are conveniently clustered around the bigger towns of Varna in the north and Burgas in the south. So those two towns, uh, apart from the fact they have airports, but they are also uh, bigger, bigger cities, they're a good base for exploration of the uh, region, wine region, wine country on the Black Sea. The, Grapes I would like to highlight. Uh, on the left, we have Dimyat, local grape variety making fresh uh, white wines. I've, I've read about uh, Dimyat being nicknamed the Balkan Chardonnay because of some similar characteristics. And then on the right, another hybrid variety called Varninsky Misket. And this is actually a cross between Dimyat, this local variety, and Riesling. So quite interesting uh, grape variety. Just a couple of wineries I wanted to show you. On the left, we have Tohun Winery. And the interesting thing about Tohun Winery is that the architecture resembles a uh, yurt. This is these big tents that the nomadic tribes are using when they, when they travel. And they've done it in this style because the Bulgarian tribes coming from Asia into Europe traveled in, in yurts. And then on the right, we have Sala Estate, very small winery uh, with limited edition wines, but great wines. Uh, also have a small guest house and a restaurant. So they can do a different type of wine tasting experiences, also the vineyard, but also in the uh, restaurant. When it comes to cultural sites, on the left, this is the town of Nesebor. And the old town of Nesebor with the fortress and the old houses is a UNESCO heritage site. Um, also not so far from Nesebor, there are resorts, seaside resorts, and of course, the Black Sea coast. Enjoying the beaches, we have a very nice, um, uh, beaches with uh, white, um, very fine sand. So there's a few really nice spots on the Black Sea coast. So with this, our virtual tour of Bulgaria is coming to an end. Uh, but before we wrap it up, I just wanted to summarize why we think Bulgaria is an interesting uh, destination for wine tourism. As I mentioned, diversity. There's diverse wine regions, uh, but also diverse wineries, uh, large, small, old, new, family-owned, traditional. Um, there's local and un unknown grape varieties, as, in, as any country has its own local varieties, so does Bulgaria. Now, the good thing about wine tourism in Bulgaria being not so developed yet is that often uh, the visits to wineries uh, are led by the owners themselves or the winemakers. And I, I, I can tell you this really changes the experience. It's a really nice, intimate uh, experience. There's a lot of culture uh, around and tradition around wine. So we have a lot of festivals. We have young wine festival. We have wine and food festivals. We have rosé festival, as, as I, uh, I told you. There's a lot of traditions that uh, revolve around wine. Just to give one example, a few days from now, 14th of February, the world will celebrate Valentine's Day. Whereas Bulgaria celebrates Saint Trifon Day, and Saint Trifon Day is the uh, patron saint of winemakers. So on this day, okay, maybe not this year, but usually wineries have open doors. They do festivities. They do ritual pruning of the vines, and it's really a lot of a lot of fun to visit around uh, that time. We didn't. We saw some pictures. I don't know if you could get an idea of the nature in Bulgaria, but it's what's interesting for me is that such a in such a small space, so many things are 
you can find so many things. You can, you can uh, be in the mountain, in the valley, at the Black Sea coast within a very short period of time. Just to give you an example, within a four and a half hour ride, you can, be, you can reach from the highest peak on the Balkans, peak Musala in the west of Bulgaria. You can drive all the way east to the Black Sea coast, only in a four and a half hours. So it's really varied landscape. Uh, I mentioned Thracians and other uh, cultural sites. Bulgaria has uh, ancient history and culture. In fact, uh, Bulgaria has the third largest number of archaeological sites after Italy and Greece in Europe. So there's lots to see in terms of culture. Uh, we didn't talk too much about, apart from spine wine, about other combinations of uh, wine and other types of tourism, but there are quite a few opportunities in Bulgaria. So we can have food and wine, hiking and wine, um, and so forth. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, virtual tour of Bulgaria. Obviously, it's not the same as visiting live, but for this, I hope to see you soon in Bulgaria. And of course, you can get in touch with us if you have any questions or, or um, anything you would like to share. And just before we open it for questions, I wanted to show you a one minute video, just to kind of show you some views from Bulgaria, what you can see um, during uh, wine tasting. You'll see um, there's usually small groups, only to be, do a lot of tours for two people as well, just to give an idea of what um, what a wine tour looks like in, in, in one minute. So I'll just play the video now um, and then we'll take uh, the questions. And for those of you who guessed the, the answer of the, of the question, there's a present in the end. Okay, let me start the video. It's pretty clear when it comes to wine, Bulgaria is definitely not messing around. The wine that we have tasted today on this tour has absolutely blown us away and we would have never tapped into it otherwise. All right, that was, that was the video. And... Yeah, I can take some of the questions now that are on the uh, on the chat. What is the name of the winery that produces sparkling wine? Francesca asks. Uh, actually, we have a few wineries producing sparkling wines so in Bulgaria now. It's kind of becoming a trend. The one that I showed is called Magura, and this is also the name of uh, the cave, Magura. Uh, Rob is asking, what is the average climate around Vidin along the Danube? That's a great question because the Danubian plain is, is, is quite, a, uh, quite a large region, as you saw on the map. It almost covers the entire northern part of Bulgaria, so it's quite varied depending whether you are close to the mountain, close to the river. Um, in general, it's, it's continental climate um, in general. The more you go towards the river, there's a bit higher humidity and the soil becomes... Um, this uh, sediment so from the river um, and this is one of the one of the region one of the reasons why for example the northwest part of the Nubian plain wants to be regarded as a separate region from the rest of the, the Nubian plain that you just kind of flat and, 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 and hilly but in terms of uh, again in terms of the climate there's quite extreme temperature differences there's very hot summer in in, in the Nubian plain all of Bulgaria but especially in the Nubian plain I'm talking about 40, 42 degrees Celsius in the summer and very cold winters. It could be minus 15, minus 20. Uh, so there's quite big extremes in the Nubian Plain. All right. Rob was uh, is saying, um, I tasted the Petit Verdot in Malbec of Domaine Marash. I was impressed. Is there a potential for these grapes? 
Petit Verdot and Malbec are more and more planted nowadays uh, in Bulgaria. And um, a few wineries now do single variety Petit Verdot. So it's not only used for, for blends, but also single varieties that are, uh, I must say, pretty good. I was surprised myself. I thought it would be too I thought it would be too much, basically, but they were quite nice and balanced, of course, with some oak aging and bottle aging. Uh, Malbec is showing some promising results. Um, what I've been interested in, what I've been interested in, is more weather, for example. There's some more weather plant in Bulgaria, and, and, and I've read with that with climate change, more weather as a bit more heat resistant grape might become a bit more widespread throughout Europe. So let's see if Bulgaria want to be one of those. Um, one of those places. Gaetano is asking, is there anyone who organizes wine tours in Bulgaria? Yes, we organize wine tours. So we exclusively do wine tours. Uh, that's our uh, our business. We only do wine tours. There's a couple of other uh, tour operators who do also other uh, tours, but they also have wine tours in their portfolio. But we do exclusively uh, wine tours. Mm, let me see. So there's a, where where is Kiosif? Kiosif is a very interesting um, family-owned winery. And it's located in the Struma River Valley uh, region, which was that purple region in the southwest of Bulgaria. Uh, always the reception there is amazing. The owner usually cooks and welcomes you himself and can talk to you for hours about how, how he got into wine, how his father was a uh, sorry grandfather was a winemaker. It's a really uh, really cool place to visit yeah um let me just scrolling down through the quay i think i think this is the last question that i see unless i've missed something um, if anyone has if anyone has something more If I may interrupt, uh, some come in at the top now. A few oh, the top. So, in at the oh, top. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sold them. Okay. Where is the Bulgarian wine sold to mostly? Uh, I suppose you mean export. If you talk about export, as I said, many goes to the EU, and within the EU, the top uh, the top markets are Poland is number one actually by far, which which might be a bit surprising, might be not. Then it's Sweden. Then it's UK. So the top three destinations in Europe for Bulgarian wine are uh, Poland, Sweden, and UK. Outside of uh, EU, uh, it's Russia, then China and US. Christine is asking, are any of the wineries which are accessible? Some are, um, but also uh, usually a tour of a winery in Bulgaria includes going to the vineyards, going into the winery, and then doing the tasting. So in terms of the vineyards, not so many are, are easy for wheelchairs. Uh, but in terms of the wineries, there are some uh, wineries that are accessible to wheelchairs. And there's even an initiative started by, uh, a, a, let's call him, he's a journalist and a wine uh, enthusiast, um, called Cheers Together. And he had put stickers to all the wineries that uh, allow are accessible for wheelchairs. So there, there are a few. Um, there are a few uh, wineries that are accessible for wheelchairs. Norbert, hi, Vasil. Any other notable producers from the Black Sea region? Yes, uh, there are quite a few. Tsarebrot, one of my uh, favorites, is kind of on the border between Black Sea and the Nubian Plain. This is a little bit inward of the Black Sea. Really great wines, uh, mainly white varieties. They're the only winery that have a variety called Gergana. It's another hybrid variety, but they're the only one who have it in Bulgaria. Um, so this is uh, this is a really nice winery as well. I mentioned I mentioned Sala, and there's some new projects coming up on the Black Sea. Uh, one called Lozito, for example, kind of a bit more independent uh, projects. Francesca, you mentioned organic producers. What about sustainable? Is there any movement in the Bulgarian wine scene for national certification? <clears throat> so as I said, uh, there's not too many. Um, organically certified wineries. There are a few. Uh, some wineries, because often in Bulgaria, uh, the vineyard of a winery is not in the same plot because of uh, ownership of land uh, issues. 
sometimes some winery certified certain vineyards for organic, but not the rest. But the ones that are organic is certified as a winery, all their vineyards are organically certified. There's some small experimentation with biodynamic, uh, but again, I say it's small experimentation, uh, not really in, in, at, on market yet. As, as for national certification, I don't think uh, this will happen soon. And I'm saying that because even some of the wineries who do organic practices, especially if they're small, they decide not to get the organic certification because of the cost and the administration that comes with it. So I think for the foreseeable future, the movement towards sustainable will be a bit more uh, grassroots and maybe not subject to certification so much. Radovan is asking, how is the wine tourist at the moment uh, during COVID? Well, if I can do, use one word, I would say non-existent. Um, unfortunately, it's been, it's been um, quite difficult time for the tourism industry as a whole, also for the wine tourism industry. And um, what we've tried to do is we've tried to uh, do some local market during the summer, for example, last uh, 2020, summer 2020, but it's a bit difficult. Um, uh, there's no big tradition among Bulgarians to go on wine tours, or if they do, they, they go themselves, they drive themselves and stay in, in, in place nearby. So, um, yeah, I would say it's uh, pretty down at the moment. Best time to visit? Best time to visit uh, yeah, spring and, and, and fall are really the best time to visit because summer can be, especially July and August, can be quite hot. Uh, winter can be cold. <laughs> uh, spring is beautiful. Fall is beautiful. For me personally, I enjoy the fall the most because then the wine is in, in action. And as I said, Bulgarian wine is very open. They bring you in the winery and everything. So they will allow you to taste from the tank, something that's fermenting or something that's gone through malolactic fermentation. So for me, fall is the best time. So you can see the winery in action and even taste some wines from tanks and barrels that are not ready yet, but you can kind of picture it, what uh, the wine might, might become. When is fall and spring? Good question, <laughs> a very good question. Um, I would say um, April until end of June, early July would be a good time, like spring, early summer time. And then the fall, September all the way until end, end of November uh, is also a good time for, uh, for a visit. Am I missing something? I think not okay. i think you got them all <laughs> got all the questions there well done <laughs> thanks thank you for all the questions and the participation yeah so lots of thanks coming in there it's been um, been brilliant yes. um and the, answer, the answer to the uh, question was 182 was it wineries 200 200 oh, sorry. 282 so if you got that right uh you win a prize which is um, actually a PDF handout of the presentation you've just been watching. So let's make that uh, available uh, for sharing. If you if you want to download the um, the PDF, then then please do so now. This is just a teaser between uh, before the real price once you come to Bulgaria. <laughs> so what's um what what's your favorite? Uh, a lot of the wineries were kind. Obviously, had a lot of investment. It's quite quite impressive with mm -hmm. uh, some of the the buildings that they've got there. Uh, where 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 do they get they're getting all their money from? Or what's the, what's the background? So that's a good question. Uh, maybe I'll just start a little bit from uh, uh, further back. As I said, after the Second World War, Bulgaria was a communist state, so the industry was state run until 1989, and it was dominated by these mastodon wine factories we call Vimproms. After the changes, uh, everything got privatized. So this, this 45 years of communist rule kind of, in a way, uh, broke the uh, tradition of ownership of wineries passing down uh, uh, generations because everything was state-owned at some point. So nowadays, a lot of the, there's a few wineries that have uh, reclaimed their uh, building or their vineyards and they're uh, re-establishing re the winery. There are a few examples of that. But also in the most cases, it's usually people who've made their money somewhere else and they either have some family history with wine or just uh, very passionate wine lovers. And they invest uh, their money into wine. So that's kind of the more standard picture at the moment. Uh, 
but there are some family wineries also with a family history of winemaking. Yes, it, 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 Armenia is kind of most of the um, produce, uh, wine producers who are living abroad have come back to Armenia to set up yeah. the wineries. Okay, good, very good. Okay, so we've got the PDF downloading uh, still available to download. Uh, so please feel free to take that away. Uh, just leaves us to say thank you very much to Basil and thank you. congratulations to you both with the um, the newborn and good luck with that. Uh, thank future. you so much. And All thanks right. for everyone, everyone for joining. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Just uh, finally, just to um, um, let me put up a link for you. Uh, for next week's um, webinars, where we're, we're looking at uh, Croatia as a grape escape destination. That's uh, next Thursday, 18th of February, at uh, 4 o'clock, 1600 Central European time. I'm not sure where that, what time that is in your part of the world, then check, please check the world mm -hmm. clock. And following that, at uh, 5 o'clock, we have um, um, a talk about... Uh, female travelers as a, a market segment that is growing um, more and more. So we have uh, Valerie Tennyson, sommelier, wine blogger and wine journalist to tell us uh, about that. Not a specifically a wine grape escape destination, but uh, very interesting for the travel agents, tour operators uh, viewing um, to tap into this market, I'm sure. So that's it. Uh, thanks again, and uh, we Thank hope to you. see you um, next Thursday eight, um, for the next session, two sessions of 10 Great Escape Destinations to Wine for in 2021. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Have a good, good day or evening.